Um, I added an item to the list of demons between which I view myself and ourselves are caught since the program was printed, namely peer review. Uh, we view the main, our main products in this community as the papers we write and publish and whatever they embody, namely theorems and attacks and proofs. But we don't produce these in a vacuum. They're shaped in a powerful way by our disciplinary culture, which is the term I'll use for the values and tastes and opinions that surround us kind of like the air we breathe. Somewhat unusually, it's questions of culture that I want to consider today, two of them in particular. The first is the relations and tensions between theory and practice in our community. And my interest in this is rooted in my own experience at the junction of theory and practice. And the second is the angst of the peer review process, which is hard for anyone these days to avoid. It seems manifest that these are important and affect us and shape us in powerful ways. Some of these are obvious, such as to affect our careers and promotions. Others perhaps less obvious in that they affect our views of our colleagues, even our views of ourselves, what problems we choose to work on, how we write, and so forth. And I believe we can benefit from change in several of these domains, but that productive change should be preceded by understanding. And this talk, if it represents anything, is a personal quest for such understanding and the view emanating thereof that disciplines exterior to ours are the ones where we can get the most insight. Uh, it, one may look askance at the intrusion into our territory, territory of these sort of alien disciplines, but given that the questions here are fundamentally about people, I think it's in the end natural. Uh, two of the works that I've been particularly influenced by are these, and the first is Kuhn's classic work on the structure of scientific revolutions, reading which to me is kind of scary. It's like reading a kind of Nostradamus prophecy come true and the way he's able to describe in a book written 50 years ago what's going on in our field in the form of what he calls normal science. And the second is Kahneman and Tversky's Nobel Prize winning work on biases and heuristics, which has already revolutionized many areas of decision making. And I find it almost absurd that we can continue to form our systems of decision making and peer review without recourse to, to their wisdom. Things like this theory and practice and peer review are things we often discuss among ourselves, but our discussions tend to be informal, private, and unstructured. And uh, uh, what that, uh, often ends up is kind of finger pointing. And what this talk is, is an attempt to move beyond that, to give us kind of vocabulary and ideas to make these kinds of discussions more structured and eventually move towards greater insight. And beyond these particular topics, I'd like to suggest that questions about a disciplinary culture are as much ones for research as technical ones within the culture. And beyond being important, these are actually intellectually intriguing. Uh, with that prelude, I come to the first part of the talk, which is on theory with practice and practice. And this is largely a retrospective on the cultures in the area and my work with Phil Rogaway on practice-oriented provable security. Uh, like many others, my introduction to cryptography was at MIT. And beyond retrospective, I'll dwell a bit on that culture because it's present in so many of us, even if implicitly passed on from generation to generation, and it forms us in ways we don't even explicitly recognize. I'd come to MIT to do theoretical computer science. I knew nothing about cryptography. But in my first semester, I took a course taught by Silvio Micali, which was entitled not just cryptography, but ironically, cryptanalysis. I don't recall any presence of the latter in the sense cryptanalysis in our community would understand it. But the course was fascinating and life-changing, uh, introducing us to the idea that security goals could be formalized and providing these kinds of notions that we now know all so well. Uh, there was a general understanding at the time that all this was providing foundations and that these foundations were essential for good practice. I don't recall at the time either agreeing with or disagreeing with this perspective. I was rather just indifferent to it. Practice at the time was boring. It wasn't what interested or motivated me. Uh, what instead drew me like a magnet was the ability to capture philosophical ideas and mathematical formalisms. The perspectives in this culture were fundamentally humanist. 
And the source of questions was not real life, but imagination and human concerns. Interactive proofs here were not about clients and servers, but about people convincing one another. Pseudorandom generators were not about uh, encryption, but about the relation between randomness and computation. Uh, the context for cryptography in this culture wasn't the rest of computer science. Rather, it was all that was best and most creative in the broad intellectual tradition of humanity. Uh, cryptography rubbed shoulders with art and music and literature, not heaven forbid with systems. Uh, if architecture was mentioned, we meant St. Peter's Cathedral, not a processor. Uh, discussions would morph between film and cryptography in a kind of seamless way. We learn not only how uh, security of encryption should be defined, but that espresso must be drunk at the right temperature and which producers of Amarone to trust. Uh, this atmosphere certainly appealed to many people, but particularly to me. At MIT, I felt surrounded by people who had been creating computers and winning math Olympiads since they were six years old, and I'd done nothing of the kind until college. My interests had been literature and history. And even then, my transition to science had been driven more by economic necessity than interest, growing up in a part of the world where a career in the humanities meant a job as a cab driver in New York. And now I found science, literature, and history, and art all united in one, which was perfect. So cryptographically, the culture we are looking at defined itself by uh, these kinds of themes, uh, humanist motivations, strong definitions of security, proofs by reduction, asymptotic analyses, and so on, as embodied, for example, now in, in uh, Goldreich's textbook. And good work was that which reflected these themes. Work which didn't was relatively minor and uninteresting. A typical theorem would look like saying that if one-way functions exist, then you can get uh, prove the existence of a way to solve some security problem. Uh, using the term philosophic for this culture is uh, somewhat uh, novel. Ironically, the only precedent I could find for the use of that term for this uh, types of viewpoints was from, well, from the adversary. Uh, Cryptolog was an NSA internal newsletter which was declassified due to a Freedom of Information Act request. And one of the articles is an anonymous NSA writer who gives a synopsis of uh, Eurocrypt 92. And let me quote of a few of the things they say. Uh, say, for example, that uh, those of you who know my prejudice against the zero knowledge wing of the philosophic camp, et cetera, et cetera, or Don Beaver, a spellbinding charismatic preacher, has captured from Silvio Micali the leadership of the philosophic wing of the East Coast, and so on. And, uh, as comes across here, the, the view of philosophy is um, perhaps uh, not uh, very positive as kind of the opposite of practice. Uh, my own view is kind of different. I just view it in the same term as the classical perception of thought. In any case, if at the time I wasn't interested in practical things, it wasn't due to lack of inducement or opportunity. Silvio was certainly very interested in the practical and convinced in retrospect, rightly so, that the theory he was developing would be of value in practice. And he would try time and again to convince me and other students to work on practical projects, but with little success. I remember him saying, you know, whenever I suggest to do something practical, one of you jumps out the window and the other out the door. And he was right. These things were just not what we wanted to do at the time. But as often happens with uh, students, we were kind of listening even if he didn't appear to be. And the things he was saying were planting seeds in my mind. And they didn't germinate while at MIT, but uh, eventually when I joined IBM, uh, they did. Uh, philosophy didn't go down so well on the job market. And when graduation looming, the only offers I had were from Ohio State and Manitoba. So I was quite excited to land an interview at IBM Research. And at that interview, I remember someone whose name I didn't then know asking me, um, what's new with hash functions? And this had me entirely confused. So what, what hash functions? What, what are they? And what could possibly be new about them? And why is he asking me? And uh, later, I learned that this was Don Coppersmith. And of course, in retrospect, what he was referring to was the series on MD5 series of work, which is going on, in fact, right under my nose at MIT. And I ought to have been expected to know about it. And at this 
uh, I'd like to make a kind of parenthetical remark that if uh, I'd ever sought a model of successful work in both theory and practice, it would have been hard to find a better one than Ron Rivest, who was right there at MIT, but yet it took my leaving MIT for me to actually recognize this. But eventually I did, and I came to appreciate and use hash functions quite a bit more, which I hope has compensated to some extent for the early ignorance. In any case, going back to, to the story, the, the response from IBM was negative. Um, I didn't get an offer there. Whether lack of knowledge of MD5 had anything to do with it, I do not know. Uh, but it seemed like IBM was in my stars, um, at least in the guise of planets. Uh, sometimes these uh, research labs feel that they have some bright idea that they want to push into practice. And this, uh, at IBM at that time, they had one such, which they called uh, the planet. It didn't mean this. It rather meant something like this. And uh, they wanted to create a network where they would build security in from the start, which is a good idea. But then for some reason, they also thought that a philosophic cryptographer would be of use in this. And this time, I was hired. Uh, my good fortune was that uh, Phil Rogoway, who had also been a student of Michali's at MIT with me, had now joined IBM in a product group at the Austin Lab. And both being in product groups, we were exposed to kind of naked, unadulterated practice. And it came as something as a shock. We were confronted with terms and objects such as these. And as cryptographers, we were expected to know what they were, but we didn't. To us, they were more like strange, mythical beasts. And this was in spite of the fact that three of these things are actually from MIT. And I think it's a nice exercise for MIT graduates to pinpoint uh, which three. Um, however, over time, this changed. And these objects became not beasts to fear, but more like friends. Uh, we learned not only to like and use them, but more importantly, we learned to respect them. And at that point, we were renegades from the MIT culture, because to them, these objects are kind of noise. Uh, we saw a gap between theory and practice, and what we did was undertake a program to bridge it. And this consisted of taking from theory uh, definitions and proofs which were lacking in practice, but from practice the goals, in particular symmetric cryptography, largely unaddressed in theory, and session key distribution, but also taking assumptions as starting points, uh, the, fact, uh, the assumption that confusion diffusion primitives like block ciphers are good. And we started what we were do, calling what we were doing practice-oriented provable security. Uh, I was not aware at the time of that this um, uh, view of Kuhn's quoted here, which paraphrase says that the themes with which a disciplinary culture identifies itself, some of them are essential, and others are almost accidental, personal choices of the creators. But in retrospect, I think that is evidenced here. Definitions and proofs by reduction are things that are essential. But into them, theoreticians also bundle things like asymptotics and the use only of number theoretic starting points. But these are arbitrary. And one of the things that practice-oriented provable security did is separate them. Uh, I recall Desert having been mentioned in passing at MIT in a dismissive sort of way, as some sort of engineering-based one-way function. And the insinuation was quite clear, namely that engineering wasn't science, and this was something to stay away from. And not only was the perspective questionable, but actually the characterization of DES isn't even right. DES isn't a one-way function, since you can invert given the key. What we did is turn instead to the notions of pseudorandom functions and permutations, which had been also suggested in the theory community, and suggested that DES and block ciphers in general be assumed to be these kinds of objects, and that this be assumptions under which we could prove security of higher level constructs. And as an example, we showed that the classic cipher block chaining mode of operation achieved indistinguishable under chosen plain text and DAC uh, under such an assumption on the block cipher. And this result was quantitative, showing an upper bound on the success probability of an encryption attacker as a function of the success probability of a PRP attacker on the block cipher plus um, other parameters. And so numerical estimates of security become possible. Uh, we started calling uh, these success measures advantage functions. And these types of results give birth to a kind of subfield of provably secure uh, cryptography focusing on the symmetric. Uh, 
in which both old and new modes of operation of block ciphers could receive proofs based on assumptions about the security of the block cipher. Uh, in some contrast to the conventional theoretical dismissal of confusion diffusion primitives, our sense was that they were not only strong, but they had strengths beyond those captured by standard formal definitions. And this led us, um, inspired by Fiat Shamir, to produce, propose the random oracle model and the associated paradigm where proofs are done in this model and then uh, you substitute uh, the random oracle with a hash function in an implementation. And we use this in particular to give methods for asymmetric encryption and signature based on RSA that for the first time we're able to have some kind of proof and yet be com uh, compete in terms of speed with existing practical methods. We found that significant practical effort was put into this problem called session key distribution. And it was a primitive that hadn't been considered in theory. And so we started doing that and gave the first theoretical treatments for both the three-party and two-party settings. Uh, message authentication was at that point just coming into play as a primitive and using hash functions like MD5 instead of at that time DES for, as, as a block cipher was good for speed. And at IBM, I was lucky to encounter Hugo Kravchik and Ryan Canetti, and together we proposed HMAC, which has subsequently seen widespread adoption in particular because it's used in TLS. Uh, the schemes we provided and lines of work we introduced have over time come to have a gratifying amount of real world impact through their incorporation into, into protocols, for example. And, uh, but beyond that, I think the things we did changed the perception that practitioners have of theory from something irrelevant to the point now where standard bodies expect and ask for proofs in any domain where it may seem possible, namely for high level constructs. Uh, discussion of practicality today feels kind of incomplete if one ignores the elephant in the room and uh, namely all the NSA programs that compromise cryptography. And obviously the things we did don't prevent these or even other real world threats such as implementation errors and side channel attacks. But Snowden himself has said that encryption is our best hope. And I think practical cryptography is, is just one step towards security, but one that is important. Uh, looking back, one of the things that strikes me is how the view of theory from practice is different from it may, what it may seem. For example, theorists think that they're helping practice when they provide efficiency improvements to other theorist protocols. But in fact, there's, in that process, they're seldom doing anything of real utility. And on the other hand, they think of definitions as although necessary underpinnings for their own work as not really being what practitioners would care about. But my sense is the opposite. Definitions and the viewpoints that go in making them are a key of utility in practice and the main transfer that theory can make, not just for proofs, but even for finding attacks. While this um, uh, uh, prior slide reflects a kind of technical dichotomy, it was hard to evade also seeing a cultural one between what I now saw the, and the phil philosophical culture. In the way it mixed up cryptography with art and literature, there was an apparent breadth, but in some sense in the end it's deceptive because the culture has a kind of selective narrowness about what it considers appropriate. Um, as usual, if one tries to say something, one finds that Shakespeare said it better when he has a Hamlet tell Horatio that there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than in all your philosophy. And he was, of course, thinking about the ghost, which uh, Horatio didn't believe in, but was now staring at. And in the same way, there are things um, which seem somehow invisible in the core part of the philosophic culture, and perhaps, unfortunately, to, to its detriment. And what is difficult, I think, is that when it's, when it's surrounded by this culture, it's seductive and overpowering, and one tends to think it's the one way to live. And it kind of takes an explicit effort to value things external to it, so that I think the hardest task for an MIT graduate, in some sense, is to unlearn that attitude. Um, in my kind of optimistic youth, I'd envisioned that working on practice-oriented provable security would make me at home in some kind of united community of theory and practice, but reality proved different. Uh, I find that when I'm uh, 
I'm kind of always on the wrong side of the fence. In the company of theoreticians, I grumble about lack of practicality or exaggerated claims thereof. In the company of practitioners, I grumble about lack of proofs or appreciation for theory. But over time, I've come to think it's not just me. There's some sort of real sense in which all of us as a community are caught between theory and practice. And this manifests itself in many ways, including uh, sensitivity to critiques, contention, and different claims. Thus, for example, most theory papers claim to have practical motivations and applications, but people who are knowledgeable about practice tell us that it's rare for these papers to actually offer anything of utility. Uh, theoreticians spend significant effort on efficiency improvements to their schemes based on the apparently genuine feeling that this aids practice. But for the most part, practitioners feel that they're improving efficiency for things nobody wants to use. And meanwhile, there are real practical problems out there which aren't even being addressed. And I've kind of grown interested in this partly because of my history as a sociological phenomenon and thought it'd be interesting to speculate about why these things happen. And the first thing that occurs to me is that perhaps this area lacks definitional foundations in the sense that the discrepancies in claims that we are seeing arise from different people meaning different things when they use the word practical. And after a career spent on definitions, I don't feel I can evade the challenge of how to define practical, so I'm going to give it a try. So theoreticians identify practicality with efficiency, and I'll call the corresponding notion EFF. F. It's not a very good notion, I think, for one thing, because of the vast ranges of possible granularity from measuring group operations to simply being allowed to call something efficient if it doesn't use a general NISIC. Um, another sense emerging nowadays is that to call something practical, you need to have implemented it and written code for it. But the most meaningful notion, and the one I think most practitioners mean, is utility. Something is practical if people actually use it, if it makes our lives better and more secure in some tangible way, if it benefits society. Then there's the capitalistic perspective, which would say that something is practical if someone is willing to pay money for it. Um, here it has to be a profit-making entity, an NSF grant or funding by your own company don't count. I think as cryptographers, we ought to target the strongest notions, as we usually do, but it is a matter of taste and choice, and to each their own. Uh, many of the phenomena we now see can be cast or considered as questions of relations between these notions. There are obvious implications. For example, if something is efficient, one ought to be able to write code for it, or if someone is paying for something, then someone else ought to find it useful. Similarly, there are some obvious non-implications, for example, Utility doesn't imply profit, and FHE shows you that implementation doesn't imply efficiency. <laughs> but but the, I think the really interesting and important fact is that neither efficiency nor implementation imply utility, and that's embodied by this separation here. And the fact is that you can make your primitive as fast as Usain Bolt, but it doesn't help if nobody wants the thing. And unfortunately, separating examples embodying this are quite common. Indeed, it feels like significant intellectual capital in our community is expended on efficiency improvements for things that no one uses. Uh, one thing I would observe is that if one does want to achieve utility, it's best done by starting with the real problem and finding a solution, a bottom-up approach, whereas in theory, the approach is often the opposite, namely to start from a primitive and then try to dream up applications. And this doesn't work so well. The, real, the reason is that the real problem, if there even was one, may not require all features of the primitive. So, so that to be able to call the primitive an application, one has to tweak or coerce the application so that the features become needed. But then this results in something artificial and not necessarily of utility. Um, in 1988, I remember my fellow grad student, Joe Killian, writing a paper snapshotted here in which he felt comfortable to give how cryptographers don't sleep well at night as motivation for his work. He attributed this as a personal communication to Silvio Micali. It's interesting that there's no effort here to pander to practice. In those days, helping people sleep was apparently good enough motivation, not only for cryptographers to do work, but for stock, which accepted the paper. And in the same kind of vein, seminal early works in the theory of cryptography, 
are notable for the absence of claims of practical applicability. The number of occurrences of the word practical, for example, in these uh, works is zero. Ironically, these works did have significant practical impact through their definitions, but there was nothing like overselling going on. But today it's a little different. If you pick up a crypto or a crypt paper, their introduction is usually some sort of application story, in particular saying how the paper addresses problems of internet security. And yet, even while we see these claims getting stronger, it's not clear that there's an actual increase in utility. Another perspective on this is that the true or internal motivations for work have stayed the same historically, things like technical challenge and philosophic interest. But while in the past these things were stated up front, they now seldom are. Instead, practicality is being used for a banner under which to sell this. And I think this situation is detrimental to both theory and practice. But to be clear, the situation I refer to is not the lack of utility, but the discrepancy between what is claimed and what is, what is achieved. In the same way, this might be seen as an anti-theory perspective, but I don't view it as that at all. Rather, I would, what I would paraphrase it as is that I prefer to see theory that's proud to say it was good theory rather than masquerading as bad practice. Um, why this kind of thing happens was, again, to me, an interesting sociological question. And um, again, I thought I would speculate. And one obvious reason is simply pressures uh, to get papers accepted, grants funded, and jobs, and so forth. And while this might play a role, I think the truth is more complex. In particular, an explanation like this seems to imply some sort of deliberate deception, which I think is rare. Instead, I think that the claims of practicality are rooted in a genuine belief in that practicality, even if that belief isn't supported by an external view and that it arises out of something I call delegated motivation. And this is a kind of mechanism by which myths of practicality are created by a kind of echo chamber as a result of the inbreeding nature of our community. So a paper is written on some primitive X, and then there's follow-up work which will try to improve its efficiency, create variants of it, and so on. And if you ask what is the motivation, those works will say, well, that's not our concern. It was already motivated and accepted as practical by prior work. And this uh, creates kind of bodies, large and small, of uh, works that believe in the practicality of something. But unfortunately, some of those beliefs can be ill-founded right from the start. So we are currently seeing a community sense that claims of practicality are somehow necessary. People feel they have to make them. And this view is fostered simply by the culture, but then it also gets perpetuated by peer review. Uh, I remember once being contacted by an author, which I'll call it for important theoretician, who was upset at their paper being rejected by a reviewer who claimed that it wasn't practical, it had no practical applications. And I'd been on the program committee and hadn't reviewed the paper, but after getting this complaint, I looked it up. And what I found is that the critique came from a theoretician, not a practitioner. And there's a kind of splendid irony here in that theoreticians reject each other's papers for lack of applications, particularly in this case where my sense was that neither the author nor the reviewer would know what a real application was if it came up and bit them. And plus, the reviewer wrote exactly the same kind of papers themselves. And uh, this seems to kind of shoot, be shooting oneself in the foot for no particularly good region, reason. Um, and this mention of peer review is my transition into a quite different part of the uh, and second part of the talk whose focus is peer review. And I guess the only main thing it has in common is this uh, sociological concerns. Um, and a troublesome domain this is. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say that decisions of acceptance and rejection in our papers are our life. They're obviously important to personal advancement but more insidiously, we let these decisions influence our views of our colleagues and ourselves. We mimic the writing styles of successful works. People work on what's more likely to get in just as they work on more and more what's more likely to be funded. So we obviously want this process to work. And I'm suggesting it doesn't. And in support of that, I'd like to begin first with some external evidence showing that respected people 
in domains outside ours think peer review is broken. Uh, Richard Horton is an editor of a respected medical journal. And let me read to you what he says. We portray peer review to the public as a quasi-sacred process that helps to make science a most objective truth teller. But we know that the system of peer review is biased, unjust, unaccountable, incomplete, often insulting, usually arrogant, occasionally foolish, and frequently wrong. Wow, this is not one happy dude. Uh, and here now is um, uh, Robert Frost uh, Higgs of the Independent Institute. And he says that peer review makes the ability to publish susceptible to control by elites and to personal jealousy. If you do not belong to some tight fraternity, it becomes extremely difficult to gain a hearing for your work. Uh, paraphrasing Kuhn, someone has said that reviewers tend to be especially critical of conclusions that contradict their own views and lenient towards those that match them. Ideas that harmonize with the established experts are, are more likely to see print. And all this is just the tip of the iceberg. If you go out there and just do a little looking, you'll see that peer review is attracting both analysis and criticism from a wide range of sources across a wide range of disciplines. And what they say is pretty damning. So let me take a few nuggets from the quotes to create a proposition for us to consider, namely that our conference peer review process too is subject to issues and critiques such as being, in some cases at least, unjust, insulting, arrogant, wrong, and so forth. And if I were to suggest or ask whether this is us, I think one's reaction may follow the sort of five-phase model for <laughs> reactions to unwelcome news, beginning with denial. No, maybe those biologists and physicists and chemists are like that, but not us cryptographers, to anger. How dare you even suggest such a thing? But what I would return is that I'm not the one suggesting it. You are, collectively. When I, one looks at how people in our community react to decisions and reviews they get, the answer is that they react very strongly with emotions that range from anger to depression. Almost all authors complain, and even program committee members at this point complain about what they see happening on program committees. And the content of these complaints echoes quite closely these little nuggets that I pulled out of the quotes. Actually, my sense is we don't complain enough, or actually, at least in the right way, because although vehement complaints are mostly in private communications and within small groups, and they really ought to be public. And even in the face of outrageous outcomes, people have simply learned to shrug it off because their sense is there's nothing you can do about it, and it's in poor taste to complain. So we actually publicly see less complaints than, than exist and that we ought to see. My own interest in peer review is rooted, as many things in graduate school. Uh, Silvio Micali used to refer to the program committee as the adversary. Uh, as many of you know, his seminal papers, including the one introducing zero-knowledge proofs, were rejected repeatedly, and this naturally led him to have a poor view of the process. But beyond Sicilian paranoia, I think his viewpoint had more than a grain of truth. When we write submissions, we try to make sure they withstand attack, where by attack we mean possible critiques that a reviewer may have and that we try to anticipate. If something may be deemed trivial, we jettison it. Um, as another influence, a typical conversation I have at conference may start with someone telling me about their work, and I say, well, that sounds nice. Uh, where is it published? And the response is, it was rejected from crypto. And then it's not like I see the, uh, that all the other papers in the program are much better. Uh, many people in our community seem to feel that the process is essentially random, that you can model uh, submissions by a probability of accept equal to the accept rate of the conference. Um, over time, I've kind of made my interest and sympathy for authors of rejected papers known, and I feel this has made me a kind of complaint box. And I hear a lot of these complaints, and it's things of that nature that have prompted me to think about and talk about this subject. And my intent today is largely to seek understanding. I want to look at issues in peer review as social phenomenon and examine them through the lens of disciplines that are external to us but well suited for the context. And that's because although unusual, they are natural because these are the tools that deal with things fundamentally about people and their motivations and can address them. And at the highest level, I believe that the benefit we get from this perspective 
is that we start seeing that the source of problems is not individuals, but basic human nature and cultural choices. And I think if we understand it that way, we uh, open ourselves up more to a uh, path to change. But before I do anything, there are a few caveats and clarifications are in order. First, I'm aware that um, there are ongoing discussions and proposals in our community about revisions to our review process. But those issues are largely orthogonal to the ones here because my concern is peer review and that continues to be present in some form in all these other systems. Second, there's no intent to be sanctimonious. I was a program chair for crypto many years ago. I don't think I did a very good job, even if I also don't know that it was possible to do better or that I was below average. Had I understood then what I do now, I wouldn't have accepted the job. Uh, nor am I proud of all the reviews I've written over my career. Third is that if whenever one suggests that there may be something to, uh, uh, going wrong with peer review, the reaction people have is to ask for alternatives and propose and discuss them. But this is kind of putting the cart before the horse. I'm going to have no specific proposals for change, but rather just an attempt to understand what's going on. Of course, I do hope that some things will change eventually. Um, I've discussed that there is a widespread presence of complaints, but this isn't the same thing as an actual community acknowledgement of a problem. And I think we need to start there because unless we wholeheartedly accept that, we're gonna have trouble thinking about change. And towards that, there are at least two obstacles to overcome. The first is that most of us wear two hats. We're sometimes authors and sometimes PC members. And sometimes we wear the hats on top of one another since PC members are often authors. And in the two positions, we may think different things. So while in the position of an author, the kind of uh, critiques I've made earlier might resonate with us, as PC members, we may prefer instead to think that uh, we are unbiased, just, fair, accountable, responsible, polite, humble, wise, and correct, and we have no elites, and we welcome critical views, and so forth. But it, uh, one ought to appreciate that both these things can't be true. Um, there's a second more subtle, but even more serious obstacle to acceptance, and that's a kind of view of human nature which says that bad things only happen if bad people are involved. And that means that blame and finger pointing are going to start, or if one has the further optimistic view that me and most of us are not bad, then you simply get a contradiction because nothing uh, critical could, should be happening. And I think that this cycle is broken by recognizing that the premise is flawed. So this optimistic view of human nature is at odds with all the findings of modern psychology and sociology, and in fact, just with plain history. Uh, biases are not some sort of vague, intangible thing. They're prevalent and real. They've been studied, identified, and labeled. And the work that had the most impact on my understanding was that of Kahneman and Tversky, which I mentioned before. And Kahneman's book is a fascinating and eye-opening read in any dimension. Uh, this is no snake oil. It received a Nobel Prize in 2002, and decision-making in many ways has been transformed by this understanding. It's actually an amusing exercise to connect some of the listed biases to phenomenon in the uh, review process to try to explain them. For example, a reviewer who, after seeing a proof, decides that it's trivial in retrospect and could be seen as an instance of the hindsight bias. The fact that a committee has an internal view in which they collectively think they've done a good job, yet the external view of authors can be very different, reflects perhaps the availability heuristic, which says that the views of PC members are more influential to others because they're available and the ones of authors are not. Indeed, uh, at this point, I've become so convinced or converted to these types of viewpoints that my sense is that if you think of yourself as completely objective, you're either a saint or an alien. So the bottom line is that bad things happen naturally even when the people involved are good. And I think this is an important perspective because it allows us to accept the presence of problems without slandering or blaming anyone. And that makes it easier to think seriously about the issues. And that takes us to the issues. And the list of these is kind of never ending. But a few things that strike me are review on negativity, reviews written in ways that makes it difficult for other reviewers to disprove them, the presence of elites and cliques and their effect, uh, 
the rejection of papers that critique or offer views different from accepted ones, a system that promotes incremental over groundbreaking work, and beyond that, just plain incompetence and incorrectness. Reviewers are depressingly negative. PCs routinely want, routinely want to reject everything. Uh, take a typical run of a process in which there may be about 200 submissions and we're targeting, say, 50 accepts. And as you know, each paper is given a score by each of three reviewers, the scores nowadays ranging from one to six, with a five being an accept. So how many submissions do you think have an average score of accept uh, at the end of the first phase when all three reviewers have turned in their reports? Well, a naive outsider might say, well, perhaps 70 or 100, and then people have to argue to whittle it down. But you know that the real answer is more like, well, it can be zero. I've seen program committees like that, and it's rarely ever more than 10. So the program committee thinks only 5% of the papers are worth accepting. How often have you seen these types of board comments? I won't fight for the paper. It's not above the bar, and so forth, without any particular indication of why not. There are PC members who don't give an accept score to any single paper out of the entire review pile. After the top 10% of papers are accepted, the reviewers don't seem to actually care what happens, and it ends up being a crapshoot. Uh, some people say this is a good thing. It means that we have high standards. But I don't think that's what it represents. For one thing, uh, it isn't like this in other communities necessarily. I asked people in areas ranging from theory to systems, and they were a bit surprised that things were like this with us, and they said in their community, things are much more positive. Now, that doesn't mean that's true for all communities, but certainly there are ones more positive than us. The second anomaly surfaces when one observes that reviewers are themselves authors, and certainly uh, they think very highly of their own works, but if you look at this situation, apparently they think highly of very little else. Well, psychologists have a term for this, or it's called the superiority bias. Although in this case, it seems evident enough that you don't need an academic to give it a name, and it's represented by the fact that most of us think of ourselves as above average drivers, or for those of you who are Garrison Keillor fans, that in Lake Wobegon, most children are above average. But I think in our context, while this would say that, yes, most of us think we write above average papers, it's not sufficient explanation because the gap is too big. And what we'll be forced to say that most people in our community think that their own work is substantially better than everyone else's. And that's one reason for such a big gap. Um, uh, one reason negativity prevails in our culture is that it, uh, we have a culture that encourages and perpetuates it in numerous ways. One of these is that negativity makes a reviewer seem smart, and reviewers like to seem smart. So you consider a negative review provided by a mean reviewer facing a positive one provided by a nice one, and given comments that say that the paper is in, has incremental techniques and is uninteresting and so forth, the vibe sent out is that the, this person must be smart and well-informed, while the other one is the opposite. And uh, what a reviewer learns then is that if they want the PC to think they're smart, and of course they do want that, then it's better to be negative. And so that's what happens. The second way in which our culture encourages rejection in that is that there's no incentive to fight for a paper. Consider the view of a reviewer who happens to be both nice and smart, but perhaps junior or just not pushy. Then there's a sort of natural, rational game theoretic calculation which says, it's not to my advantage to fight for a paper because it would antagonize other reviewers, which decreases my utility function, but there's no corresponding gain because the authors will never know what happens, so why bother to fight for anything? Uh, the third way in which our culture encourages rejection is by simply making it a tradition. Every time we write a nasty review, what we're doing is educating its reader to write the same kinds of reviews. When this graduate student gets a slew of rejections on his submissions, the message he takes away is that it's the job of a reviewer to reject. And indeed, when he comes of age and steps onto the PC, that's what he does. And this explains the phenomenon that puzzled me at first, which is why is it that young first-time PC members are often the most negative ones out there. Uh, another broad issue is the content of reviews, in particular, the presence of terms like these. Surely you've seen them. The paper is not surprising. It's trivial. 
And as a start, I have trouble even understanding what they mean or what they have to do with the quality we're trying to evaluate. I feel like telling the reviewer if they want surprises, they should go ride a roller coaster or read a mystery novel rather than review papers. But more important is the position in which these types of comments place other reviewers or even authors who want to rebut them. Uh, we speak in our community of assumptions that are not falsifiable, meaning hard to disprove. Well, these comments are kind of the same. If someone has decided not to be surprised or interested, there isn't really much that's going to change it. And the result is that these kinds of comments are intimidating and hard to dislodge. There ought to be some kind of rules that falsify comments have to be falsifiable. Um, it would be hard to deny that there are cliques in our community, by which I mean, well, just groups of friends, people uh, in, or others, in either small or largest groups who have common interests, who socialize, they write papers together. Often they're bound by relations such as uh, academic peers or advisor-mentor relationships, alums of the same place and so forth. Or they may just be working on the same topic. So the clique effect says that if members of a clique are well represented on a program committee, then papers by those members, whether on or off the committee, will have a disproportionate representation in the program. And this is not something imaginary. In fact, it's routinely the case that people in our com community complain about this and believe it happens. And indeed, at times, it's hard to avoid um, that, seeing that it happens just by looking at the relation between the composition of a program and the PC. Now, we could spend time debating or arguing about the existence of the effect. But what I'm going to suggest instead is that the effect is real and try to ask why it happens. And I believe that the explanation will show in some ways that it must happen. Uh, Mills was a sociologist at Columbia University who studied elites. And he postulated a fascinating effect that I'll paraphrase in our context as follows. It says that the clique effect doesn't arise due to conspiracy and collusion of clique members. It is automatic. It's a result of their having shared culture and background. Or in more cryptographic terms, suppose we fix a clique K that has a non-trivial intersection with the PC. And now let's consider two games. In the bad game, the clique members on the PC are malicious. They collude, they de-anonymize their papers to each other, and they accept mostly papers by clique members on or off the PC. But in game good, they behave as responsible and ethical PC members. They operate independently. They provide what, in their honest perspective, are fair, accurate, and independent reviews. But what Mills is saying is that these games will have indistinguishable outcomes. And thus, in the second game, the uh, disproportionate number of mem papers by members of the clique that you would predict in the first game will also arise. And the reason is that it's the common culture, values, and tastes of the clique members leading to their having the same kinds of opinions and forming the same kind of judgments. Or put another way, the text in red in game good is important. While these PC members are being ethical and fair, it's according to their own very personal perspective. And this perspective is in common with others. Uh, Kuhn describes how fields are born out of revolutionary ideas, which in our cases are things like public key cryptography, RSA, or the theory of modern cryptography with definitions and proofs by reductions, as given by Golvas and Mikali. And once these revolutions take place, the field settles into what he calls normal science, where the establishing paradigms are accepted. But in fact, it is more than just being accepted. They quickly become religion. Research is defined as solving clear, technically challenging problems within the paradigm. And this is very much the stage we are in now. The salient fact from the reviewing perspective is that there's a powerful opposition to critiques and to novel or opposing viewpoints. So any papers which offer these things tend to be rejected. Reviewers view themselves as defenders of the faith and the, whose job it is to protect the field from criticism. And this is also a phenomenon that people have complained about in our community. And again, rather than uh, uh, what I want to do is kind of explain it. And I believe what Kuhn says um, does that. Uh, PC decisions are largely taken by consensus arising out of discussion or reflected in the average score. And one result is that on the borderline, what is accepted, rather than being what someone likes, is what nobody hates. And that means that mediocre and incremental work that's inoffensive is what's going to dominate. 
But the difficulty is that important work often has criticism as its core, and it's almost bound to offend someone. Indeed, you might say that offending someone is almost a mark of character for a paper. And so work like that is hard time getting in. So having given all these sorts of critiques and indications of our human limitations and the fundamental difficulty of doing good reviews, I asked myself if there was any sort of model for how a reviewer ought to function in the ideal case. And one could refer that back uh, by analogy to the broader philosophic question of how best to live one's life. And while this has been investigated in depth and the law of the world contains long answers, it turns out that they all agree on this pity rendition that we call the golden rule. And one form of that is to treat others as you would like them to treat you. So I wonder if just as a thought experiment, we could have a golden rule of reviewing, which is to review the papers of others as if they were your own. It would be kind of amusing to see the outcome of this being the guidelines for reviewers. It would be rather hard to reject papers. However, all, this, uh, all that I've said so far is a theoretical kind of view. In practice, it's really not going to change anything, at least directly, because none of us think of ourselves individually as doing anything as reviewers we shouldn't. And the psychologists actually have a name for this one as well. It's called the bias blind spot. And that takes me to what, from a practical perspective, is the fundamental problem with the reviewing process, namely that there's no accountability. There's no place to appeal a decision. There's no way to overturn a decision. And reviewers are subject to zero consequences, regardless of their actions. The president of the United States can be impeached, but there's nothing to touch a PC member, no matter what they do. <laughs> but we have thousands of years of human history to tell us that when power is not balanced by accountability, it's going to get abused, even by the best people with the best intentions. Uh, in other words, what makes peer review, as we practice it, a blatantly broken, dark ages system is that it is at odds with the essence of human nature and the lessons of history. Processes for decision making and judgment in the real world are realistic. They know that decision makers are biased even with the best of intentions, and they compensate by adding checks and balances and accountability. And we, on the other hand, implicitly make the assumption that people, reviewers placed in power, are ubiquitously fair, and all we need is to trust them and have no accountability. And this is not only kind of ludicrous in general, but we are a community whose motto is trust no one. And when we see this, it should be no surprise that the system fails. I think a useful metaphor for the conference decision process is to look at it as a court of law. So think of the submitted paper as the queue sitting in the dock. Uh, in both cases, a binary decision must be reached. The program committee is like a panel of judges. The program chair is kind of like the chief justice. Perhaps you could think of sub-reviewers as kind of like witnesses. But the resemblance kind of ends there, because in the real world, people have understood that judicial systems need checks and balances to deliver justice. And these have been inserted. And in our case, this hasn't happened, leading to the following types of differences. In a court, the accused is assigned a lawyer to defend them who can object to procedures or statements online while they're happening, while our submissions after they're submitted kind of have to swim on their own at the mercy of judges. In many courts, debates and judge opinions are public, and our courts are secret tribunals, and we know what reputation those have in the real world. Um, in the real world, judge appointments are reviewed and approved by some sort of semi-public process, which is not at all true in ours. In the real world, judges are appointed by external parties, in our world, the Chief Justice appoints all the rest of the panel. In the real world, decisions can be appealed, and in our case, they cannot. Now, having said that, one might argue that rebuttals play in part the role of a defense advocate, or that resubmission plays in part uh, the role of an appeal. But these, I think, are poor proxies for many reasons we don't have to get into. So I suppose people might be looking aghast at the specter of lawyers and research. But I wonder if it's really so preposterous. Look at the kind of comments we see on reviews and uh, the things written in blue here. Have you ever found yourself asking on thing, things like that, where was my lawyer to provide the simple rebuttal shown in orange? Then these things shouldn't be happening, but at present there isn't anything to stop them. But still, I should be clear that a court of law for me is merely a metaphor here. I'm not trying to advocate that we actually explicitly mimic the processes but just that it's a useful comparison point to bring home some of the gaps in the system.
So uh, that brings us kind of to the obvious, obvious question, which is, well, if there are so many questions, at least from some perspectives, what is it that we should do? Well, I don't know what the answer to that is. Um, another of my favorite authors, Daniel Quinn, in one of his books mounts a kind of all-encompassing critique of human culture. And when the protagonist in the book is asked what to do about it, his answer is treat it as a problem and think. And I'm afraid that's the best I can offer as well. Imagine that we spend 5% of our research time not on the technical questions within the discipline we usually concentrate on, but on understanding and improving culture in particular peer review. Well, surely a community as creative as ours would come up with not one, but many ways in which to improve things. I would imagine that these would have to be tested. We would come up with experimental venues and so forth and uh, have to spend some time sorting things out. Uh, there's a lot of ideas external to ours that we can look at. Decision making, even let's say like in the Olympics where uh, in some competitions, the highest and lowest judge scores are dropped. Uh, Kahneman's book has a fascinating account of how he took uh, the Israeli army interview process for pilots or something, and which was not working well, and introduced a kind of narrow set of review criteria coupled with uh, automation and got substantially better results. And there are many other such things. Um, our culture is around us everywhere, like the air we breathe. And I think we benefit from making its presence more explicit. I've said a lot of things today that are certainly opinionated, personal, possibly flawed. It would be very easy to poke holes in anything I say. But this is fuzzy, unexplored territory. And I've tried to tread this path because I think it matters to us that I think we should spend time understanding our culture and then using that understanding as a basis for change. And uh, thanks for your time and attention.